From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on November 27th, 2023. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome to a, a very, very special episode of our Quality Quorum for today. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 18th episode of Matters Microbial. I am so grateful for every view, every listen, and every comment. Thank you all. Today is a podcast episode devoted to an extremely charismatic type of virus, the bacteriophages. Beginning and advanced micronauts have surely seen electron micrographs of bacteriophages as seen here. Please remember that this is completely different than the kinds of viruses that give you the sniffle or far worse in the pandemic. In fact, bacteriophages are viruses that recognize, attack, and consume bacteria only. So who knew that something that might make you sick can get sick? And this brings me to a a member of my Wunderkammer that literally and physically does not fit into my cabinet of wonders. One of my first year biology students for an extra credit creative project made me this ginormous metal sculpture of a bacteriophage, as you can see here. It's literally hard for me to pick up. And phage-centric images are everywhere in my life, from this bacteriophage pin, as seen here, to a 3D bacteriophage that I can make at home, like this one seen here. Knowing me as you surely do by now, the next step at home was to create fluorescently glowing 3D phages, as seen here. We even created translucent 3D printed bacteriophages, stuffed little blinking lights inside and called them discophages, as you can see here. Even four discophages in a row, discophage in a row, are really quite beautiful, but don't you agree there should be some music in the background? My microbiology students, my micronauts, even got into the idea of glow-in-the-dark bacteriophage earrings, as seen here. And finally, on a shelf next to me, even as I speak, a bacteriophage pot for a new houseplant. So it seems that phage really is all the rage, but not simply because they're charismatic and not simply because they consume some types of bacteria. There are many, many scientists and other people who confidently predict that bacteriophages can be used to treat antibiotic-resistant bacterial diseases. And who better to tell us about that path than that force of microbial nature, better known as Dr. Stephanie Strathdee of UC San Diego's Medical School. Welcome to our Quality Quorum, Stephanie. It's truly an honor to have you on the podcast and share your story with listeners and viewers. Thanks so much. It's great to see you, uh, Mark. And, uh, you know, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. And uh, now I'm a micronaut, too. You are a micronaut, although I should probably start talking about vironauts, shouldn't I? Yeah. So the first thing that I thought would be really interesting is for you to tell everybody what your official titles are, because I am really impressed by you. So please. Well, thanks very much. Um, you know, I, I have a PhD, but it's not in microbiology. It's in epidemiology. I started out with a bachelor's degree in microbiology from the University of Toronto in Canada, where I did all my degrees. And uh, for the last 20 years now, I've been based at the University of California, San Diego, where I am a distinguished professor I'm the Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences, and um, I now co-direct the first dedicated phage therapy center in North America, the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, known as IPATH. That's really remarkable. And 
what's the only good thing about growing older, I should say, is watching ideas come to fruition. And many folks, I mean, I did my PhD work on bacteriophages. It, admittedly, they were rhizobium bacteriophages, not in any way of interest to anyone other than soil microbiologists like I was at the time. But what I wanted to say is that I've watched this idea develop over time. And that's why I'm so delighted to have you here, because you are the exemplar of this. Could you well, please tell the story? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a crazy story. Um, it's really one where my, you know, academic profession and my personal life collided in a pretty spectacular way. Uh, my husband and I were on vacation over American Thanksgiving in 2015. Um, we went to Egypt. He'd always wanted to see the Valley of the Kings. And there had been a terrorist attack, unfortunately, in Sharm El Sheikh a couple of weeks prior. And we almost canceled. Um, but he said, oh, no, it's the perfect time to go. No, no crowds. And I said, rolled my eyes and said, OK. I literally wrote out an addendum to our will and left it behind for my parents, along with the keys and um, the instructions for my, my um, worm farm, because um, I'm pretty nerdy in a lot of different ways. And um, we were on having a great time. You know, um, my husband looked to be in perfect health. He was six foot five, almost 300 pounds. So he was heavy, definitely overweight, but there was no sign of what was to come. In fact, the terror didn't come uh, from a, a terrorist attack like I had feared. The terror ended up coming from within. Because what happened is after we'd had this lovely seafood meal on top of a cruise ship and we were supposed to see King Tut's tomb the very next day, he acquired what looked um, initially to be food poisoning. He was vomiting. He had a distended abdomen. He was just miserable. Uh, he was just up and down all night long. And of course, um, I'm beside him and I was getting annoyed because he was keeping me up. I mean, I was not the the wonderful wife that um, I'm portrayed to be. Uh, but I did all get worried when he wasn't able to keep anything down. We called a doctor to the ship. The doctor gave him intravenous gentamicin and some fluids, said he's going to be fine. He'll be up for dinner in a couple hours. And if he's not, you know, let me know. And that's when I realized that something was going wrong because all of a sudden he started complaining of back pain. Well, that's not a symptom of food poisoning, right? I was I was lying there up until that point, you know, calculating incubation periods in my head for the different kinds of microbes that he might have ingested in a cream puff or, you know, in a, a, a muscle. Um, and when he started complaining of back pain, you know, I'm not a physician, but I thought, well, this is actually could be something else. Maybe I'm jumping to conclusions. So luckily, I was able to get on the phone and call a colleague of ours who was the head of infectious diseases at the um, University of California, San Diego, where we're both professors. And this was Dr. Chip Schooley. And he got back to me right away and said, you know, get him to the closest hospital, go to where the expats go. Um, it could be a food poisoning, but it could be a twisted bowel. It could be something worse. And so um, there was no hospital in Luxor where we were based. Um, the doctor who uh, initially saw him said, let's take him to a clinic. And we got him to a clinic. We woke up all of the doctors um, that could help. And um, they diagnosed him with pancreatitis, which is essentially an inflammation of the pancreas. And those of your listeners who are in medical school or who aspire to be, will be told one thing um, when they're looking at a, a body um, is that is the pancreas. The only rule is don't touch it. it they get very upset when they get um, inflamed. So pancreatitis, I thought, well, okay, they know what it is. They can treat it. We'll be home tomorrow, right? Uh, not so fast. Turns out this is just a symptom of a much larger problem. Um, and uh, they stabilized him when we were medevaced first to Germany thank God for travel insurance. And there they um, had us in isolation in the ICU um, because they said, you know, you've come from Egypt. We're just, um, you know, this is hopefully just a precaution. But then they did an endoscopy where they put a tube down and they saw that he had a giant abscess the size of a small football in his abdomen. And they took out a gallstone that had lodged in his common bile duct. So essentially what he had had was not food poisoning. It was a gallstone attack. But this abscess basically was created from the pressure 
in his biliary tree. And the doctor showed me a flask of absolutely putrid brown gunk. And he said, look, this is the, uh, the sample that we took out of, you know, his, his cyst. And if this um, abscess had just formed, that fluid would be clear. And it's not. Clearly, it's not. There's something growing in it. Well, he says, that's a good reason that we have you here in isolation. Well, I thought, okay, um, there's something growing in it. Fine. They'll, they'll culture it. They'll figure out what bug it is and they'll treat it. Right. Um, this is, we're in a modern hospital. It, you don't pick up a bug on vacation. That's un- incurable or do you turns out this was actually not your garden variety microorganism. This was Acinetobacter bomanii. And um, your listeners who have uh, become uh, familiar with this organism will know that it's what's called an escape pathogen. Now, I'm not talking about those escape rooms that you, uh, you know, play with. Uh, uh, This is uh, really um, a different kind of an acronym. It's um, the acronym is E-S-K-A-P-E. And each of those uh, letters stands for a different superbug or a bacteria that's resistant to multiple antibiotics that is a threat to human health. So the Acinetobacter bomanii is the A in the escape. And unfortunately, although this used to be an organism that I played it on my Petri dishes back uh, at the University of Toronto when I was an undergrad student, say around 1986, um, it has acquired superpowers. And what I mean by superpowers, I mean virulence factors. I mean things like the ability to form biofilms, which I know Mark is a fan of. Um, they're, they're really great when they're, um, you know, in a test tube or on a Petri dish. Uh, they're not so great when you have an organism who, uh, w- that forms biofilms because they're really like the microbial version of the Borg. You know, they um, really um, form a community with other cells and other um, like critters microbial critters that is and it's very hard for antibiotics to get through biofilms so it looks like a slime essentially um and um you know acinetobacter bomania can it can stick to hospital linens it's uh it's got um you know uh, a number of other virulence factors as well it can even stick to body lice i mean how gross is that so um, when I realized that this was Acinetobacter bomania and had this flashback to the 1980s when I was a student, I realized, well, like, wow, like that was an organism that we used to consider really like to be quite wimpy. Like, how could this all of a sudden gain these superpowers and, and you know, become what the World Health Organization considers is to be one of the dirty dozen, the 12 most concerning bacterial pathogens to human health? Well, it's really good at stealing antimicrobial resistance genes from other bacteria. And when you're throwing um, like these heavy duty antibiotics that I call the gorilla cillins at somebody, then it really kills those friendly bacteria in the microbiome and creates more space for the acinetobacter bomania to just move in. So uh, I'm reading up on this and I'm realizing, oh my God, like I've really been behind the eight ball. Like I've, I've been an infectious disease epidemiologist, but my career has focused on HIV and related viruses. And I really have been blindsided by the superbug crisis. And all of a sudden now my husband is one of the people that I've been reading about, like that we are in a post antibiotic era where a simple scrape or um, a simple surgical procedure could mean that you acquire a bacteria that is resistant to all antibiotics. So sadly, um, Tom's bacteria was resistant to multiple antibiotics right off the top and then acquired even more resistance over the next few weeks. So that's how it began. You know, I wanted to tell you that I've been working with Acinetobacter for some years, but as a kind of a defanged version, should, I should tell the, the listeners and viewers that uh, the people who work with, for example, the Tiny Earth crowdsourcing program to look for new sources of antibiotics, they use, quote, safe relatives of the escape pathogens. And so there's a Acinetobacter bailei that's often used, which has not been reported to be involved with disease, but it's a sponge. It picks up DNA from the environment very, very quickly. Now, if you put that, as you mentioned, in one of your Borg biofilms, 
And there's lots of things breaking open and growing. And that's just a fertile ground for all of this genetic. I'm going to just call it horizontal gene transfer. Exactly. Because there's lots of things going on. And it's remarkable. So I it would be such a night for nightmare to, to have something that maybe I worked with a little bit causing this trouble. And incidentally, having had my gallbladder removed after pancreatitis, I sympathize. Yeah, well, it didn't stop there. I mean, the, the German hospital had to report this organism to the uh, German authorities because this is an organism that has caused outbreaks in hospitals known as yes. nosocomial infections. And um, they were so serious that people died. Whole hospitals were shut down. Now, the irony is that after Tom was stabilized and um, medevaced back to San Diego, um, where he's now at the university hospital that we work at, this was no longer a reportable disease to the CDC, it, it, even though it had acquired even more resistant and was essentially pan resistant. So resistant to all antibiotics. So it's just an example of how poor our global surveillance really is um, that has led us to underestimate the number of people that are affected by this. So the next stage is, is where we bring in our, our, microbe well i can our virological friends in this case well yeah i mean for the first couple months that tom was in the hospital um what we had hoped was that his immune system could kick in to fight this pan resistant bacterium because he was too weak for surgery and they were worried that if they did operate and this organism got into his bloodstream that he would undergo septic shock so your listeners that might have heard of, of sepsis or septic shock, um, they might not have seen it. Um, and because sepsis is such a serious problem in hospitals, um, and everybody should know what it looks like and what to do. Um, and when Tom um, was in the hospital and this organism ended up entering his bloodstream anyway, because one of these drains that they were trying to um, use to siphon off the infected fluid slipped and poured all that fluid from the abscess into his abdomen, into his bloodstream. Literally, he went from having a conversation with me to all of a sudden breathing heavy, um, sweating profusely, heart rate, like boom, 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 boom. And then he started to sweat and shake. And the shakes are called the rigors. And he shook so badly that the bed frame hit the wall. And um, I, I was like, like just um, beside myself. Luckily, a nurse and a doctor were right there. They knew exactly what was happening. He was rushed back into the ICU because up until this point, he had been getting a little bit better. But from that moment onward, it was all downhill. I mean, literally now this organism was everywhere in his body. So it wasn't just in his bloodstream. It wasn't just in his abdomen. It was in his sputum. It was, um, it was everywhere. And um, so he was fully colonized um, with a pan resistant bacterium, this acidobacter bomanii, and he was dying a little bit each day. Um, and the doctors told me that he wasn't going to make it. And, um, you know, I was stunned and I had a conversation with him while he was in a coma. I wasn't even sure if he could hear me, but I said, you know, if you want to live, like, um, please squeeze my hand and I'll leave no stone unturned and I'll try to find something to, to kill this thing. And he squeezed my hand. I mean, like I, it was just amazing. And, um, so then I did what anybody would do. I, I went home and I hit the internet. Now, um, those of your listeners who are scientists or, or junior scientists might be familiar with the search engine PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. It's a search engine that the National Library of Medicine has developed. It's freely available to anywhere around the world. Even your grandma can use it. You can stick um, keywords in there like acetobacter bomanii, um, alternative treatments, antibiotic resistance, and see what pops up. And lo and behold, uh, this paper that was published by some researchers in Spain um, popped up and buried in this was something called bacteriophage therapy or phage therapy for short. And that rang a bell. That's fabulous. Um, you know, I was waiting for this moment, but where do you go next when you, when you've heard about it, who do you talk to? And Having had many relatives in in fairly dire circumstances, you really need someone to act as a spokesperson, as an advocate. And this is one of the reasons that I call you a force of, of nature, because you are. And that's what you did. 
you made all these things happen through force of will, didn't you? Well, you know, when your back is up against the wall and somebody that you love is um, in danger, you know, you do whatever you can. I mean, we read stories of, you know, mothers lifting a truck because their kids trapped underneath or something like you may not be a super human, but you develop the superpowers to do it. And so I had a lot of help. Of course, I didn't do this just myself, but I did um, some research found that, that phage therapy was um, considered experimental in the West, was only being offered in parts of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And that's a whole other story as to why. And um, there was a BuzzFeed article that uh, where um, it reported that medical tourists were going to these parts of the world to obtain phage therapy. And of course, Tom was too sick to do something like that. So I asked the head of infectious diseases, the same Chip Schooley, who had been helping me all along, I said, what do you think about phage therapy? Could we use this to try to save Tom? And he said, wow, what, what an interesting and intriguing idea. It may be ahead of its time. Um, and it turns out we, we were 100 years behind this time because phage had been discovered in 1917 and first used in, in patients in 1919. And here we were at this was 2016 at this point, and, um, and the FDA considered ex it experimental. But, you know, Chip said, if you can find phages that will be a match for Tom's bacterial isolate, I'll call the FDA and see if I can get permission to give it to him on a compassionate basis, because there's a process for, for um, experimental treatments um, for patients that are dying. And it's called an emergency investigational new drug or an EIND. But first we had to find the phages and that turned out to be a whole other thing. So you you don't you, this this is nothing we've talked about but many years ago I I lived in San Diego and I worked for a company and we were using an organism a bacterium called Xanthomonas campestris to make a polymer called xanthan gum which you can find in, as a suspending agent in many things like salad dressing and one Big of Max. my <laughs> yes um one of my jobs though uh was when we we called it hitting the bell what would happen is that no matter how many times I told the engineers to be careful, their outflow would get sewage back into the fermenter, and then their production strain would just be destroyed by a population explosion of bacteriophages. Then I had to be in what they laughingly thought of as a clean room and make a phage-resistant mutant of that bacterium. But it never worked. Because they'll be they'll be a phage that can take advantage of that as well, and that's something that makes it quite remarkable. So, where did you go for your phages? Well, once I started to do more reading, um, I had a long way to catch up since my virology class in 1986, uh, which is where I first learned about phage. Um, I, I then found that there was an estimated 10 million trillion trillion phages on the planet. That's a non-alien or a 10 to the power of 31. And I was just daunted. I thought, oh my God, how am I going to find phages that are going to be a match? Because it turns out this is like the lock and key kind of a mechanism, right? It, it's not just any phage is going to be a match for any bacterium. Some of them are super finicky. And it turns out that Acinetobacter bomanii phages don't just have to match to the genus and the species. They have to match to the isolate. So that meant that you know Tom's isolate had to be sent to whichever lab was going to be willing to do a phage hunt and that they had to see, um, you know, do the old fashioned plaque assay to see whether or not um, they had any phages that were matched. And so I did a search on PubMed for researchers that were studying phage and acetobacter and, and were close enough that, um, that they could help. And it was a very short list. Um, Dr. Ryland Young from Texas A&M University, who I know you're familiar with, um, he contacted me right away and said, look, um, your story struck a chord with me. I'm the same age as your husband. I've always I was hoping that phage therapy would come back someday. And maybe you're the person who could cut through the red tape to do it. So why don't you send me his bacterial isolate? I'll turn my lab into a command center. And he said, uh, so we'll go on a, a phage hunt. And he says, you know where we're going to look for these things, don't you? And by that point, I had done enough homework to realize that he was talking about some of the gnarliest places on earth, like, you know, sewage, treatment facilities, barnyards, because wherever you find a lot of bacteria, you find the perfect predator, the phage that will feed upon them. 
He also said that he would reach out across the pond to colleagues around the world who were also studying phage and see if any of them had some phage that were already characterized and sequenced that could be a match. And so Dr. Jean-Paul Pernay, who leads um, a a phage therapy program now at the um, Royal Astrid Military Hospital in Brussels, it was a a very nascent program at the time, Um, but he said, well, Um, you're in a hurry, I can send phage in a diplomatic pouch. Um, And so that was really wonderful. Um, But it turns out that those phage were not a match for Tom. But in the meantime, um, Dr. Uh, Adriana Carolina um, Hernandez, um, who um, was a PhD student and is now a PhD grad from Rye Young's lab, slept in the laboratory, put all everything on hold, as did Jason Gill and many other people in the lab. and they found four phages that were a match. Um, and Adriana called them um, Mago and, and Maestro um, uh, because she's Spanish. And so uh, magic and, and, uh, and uh, Maestro is Maestro. So um, I was very excited to hear this. And um, Chip called the FDA official. And I thought that they were going to have to explain all about what phage was and why we needed to do this. And they were already very well acquainted with phage. In fact, they said that they'd been looking for a patient like Tom, who was, you know, at death's door, family member willing to give it to him, university hospital um, um, that was willing to cut through the red tape and take the the risk, and a phage community that was ready to step up to the plate in time. So essentially, all the planets had to line up to save Tom Patterson, and they did. The phage community was outstanding. We had offers from phage, for phage from um, Switzerland, India, um, the Republic of Georgia. Um, it turns out we didn't need them. Um, another group that stepped up was the U.S. Navy, um, and they had sourced phages from the bilges of ships. And turns out their phage program really originated after 9-11 um, when there was uh, contaminated letters that um, were, um, um, you know, streaked with anthrax spores. And they had been sent to congressmen and um, to other people. And um, this lab, um, the the BDRD, as it's known um, in the Navy, um, they used phage to detect those anthrax spores. And that's what started their program. So uh, that team found four phages that were a match. So you might be wondering, okay, well, why do we need so many phages? If you've already found several from Texas, why do you need more? Well, the, the philosophy at the time was the more phages, the better. We didn't have time to sequence them. We didn't know what receptors they were hitting. We just hoped that they were varied enough that the bacteria would have a hard enough time um, mutating to resist it. So what this means is that every single phage you received received had to be checked against your particular, I don't know if I'm using the word pathovar, pathogenic variant, but your particular subspecies of Acinetobacter. But you found them. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. So from my very first email to Rye to the day that we had phages ready to treat Tarm with, it was only three weeks. I mean, compare that to what happens with a new antibiotic. It takes 10 to 15 years to develop a billion dollar price tag or more. I mean, this was astounding. Half of that time was actually purifying the phage uh, preparation um, because endotoxin has to be um, removed when you have a gram-negative bacterium like Acinetobacter baumannii, the lipopolysaccharide layer of the capsule, the bacterial cell wall, um, ends up being toxic to humans or, or animals. And so when you're growing up phage in great quantities, you're essentially letting bacteria and bacteriophage duke it out at a minuscule level, right? It's like World War III in a test tube. And um, then you're left with this bacterial debris which is essentially this LPS or or, um, lipopolysaccharide, which is the endotoxin. And if you just give this this preparation without filtering it or removing the endotoxin to the patient, especially if you're going to use it intravenously like we did with Tom, which was part of the innovation, then it it could actually elicit septic shock. And God knows Tom had already had six cases of septic shock. He couldn't undergo another one. And we weren't really sure what the threshold for safety was. Um, We now know that five endotoxin units per kilogram weight of the patient per hour is um, relatively safe. And that's what we use. And that's what we we used at the time. 
Um, and that was with some guidance from the FDA. But it was San Diego State University uh, researchers who stepped in at the last minute because the endotoxin um, a level was way too high in the initial phage preparation. And so we we needed their specialized services and they were on hand and they happened to have it on board. So uh, we were lucky in so many ways. And, you know, basically Tom was in end stage, um, like multi-stage organ failure. So lungs, heart, kidneys, all failing. And he was on life support. It was in hours, within hours of dying, I was told. And once we injected these phages into him, um, every two hours, he received 10 to the 9 PFU per mil, or a, essentially a billion phages per dose every two hours. And then three days later, he woke up, lifted his head off the pillow and kissed his daughter's hand. I mean, holy crap. That's a wonderful story. And plaque forming units, just a measure of the number of viruses that are present. So just, and I really appreciate what you said about endotoxins. And this is something relevant to every listener and viewer. If you look, for example, at uh, people who use insulin and that insulin has been made through recombinant DNA techniques, generally speaking in gram negative bacteria, you'll see no endotoxin. And what they're talking about is lipopolysaccharide which is a powerful pyrogen, causes fevers like crazy. So obviously, if you blow, if these cells are being blown apart by phage, you have to get rid of those endolysins and similar types of, of compounds. I mean, but what a success story to see that rapid turnaround. It was amazing. And, and you know, obviously, I did not do this by myself. I'm not like Wonder Woman or anything like this. I had a lot of help. It's just that, you know, I, I also really credit my virology professor, Dr. Munir Abu Haidar from the University of Toronto, who I made sure that I went back to visit um, and told him the story because, uh, you know, 1986 was a long time uh, prior and uh, I basically remembered his lecture from class. So if you're a student and you're bored of virology or whatever course you're taking, just remember that you might learn something that someday might save a life. It's a really amazing story, and I'm so glad your husband is better. I believe you you have photographs of him that you know show him after the fact, uh, and how what a wonderful he, he owes you. Let's just put it that way. I think well, he whatever takes out you, the garbage every time I ask. Let me tell you, <laughs> pretty much whatever he wants, you, you know, he, whatever you want, he'll have to do. Well, we're very fortunate, and one of the most gratifying aspects of our story is that. Um, the protocol that was um, used to save Tom was published in a paper um, by Chip Schooley in the journal AAC. And um, now that uh, protocol has been replicated in many other patients that saved lives. Um, there are now phage therapy centers around the U.S. at Baylor. Um, they have a, a program called Taylor. The um, Yale has a phage therapy program. The Mayo Clinic in Rochester has one. There's others popping up. Belgium has a bona fide program that's uh, world class. Uh, there's phage therapy programs in Sw Sweden, Switzerland. Um, there's a phage Canada, a phage Australia. There, of course, the Republic of Georgia and Poland have been um, offering phage therapy for decades, and they're going, okay, it's about time you Westerners caught up with us. And uh, and I've heard that China now has a program in, based in Shanghai. So phage really is all the rage. You, you know, it's interesting. Whenever I've talked about this with students, and they'll say, well, well why did it take this long? And, you know, the answer is the discovery of, of modern antibiotics pushed everything back to one side. If you go back and, oh, um, who wrote Aerosmith? Is it Upton Sinclair? Sinclair? Yes. And, yeah. and in fact, Felix de Harel, who was the discoverer of the bacteriophage, he was uh, the inspiration for the protagonist in Aerosmith. So my point that I'm trying to get is that these were things that were kind of like battling around inside people's heads. And then this like quick, this quick idea happened. But the problem with antibiotics, of course, is the bacteria can evolve to become resistant. But what I need to really make clear to everyone is that it's very hard to have a situation where a bacterium becomes resistant to a bacteriophage that another bacteriophage can't go after. And, and that's because both sides are working. 
Well, that's right. And, you know, clearly, even in Tom's case, we saw that back, that his Assinidobacter bomanii did develop resistance, in fact, relatively quickly, because all of those phage were very closely related. They were hitting the same receptor. Right. Um, but when you have almost a limitless supply of phage, you can go back to a phage library, if you have one, and source phage from that library to match the bacterial mutants. And so um, we were lucky enough to be able to do that in Tom's case. We even saw evidence of antibiotic phage synergy. And I'm very excited about that potential because it means that if you could predict which phages go with, with other phages or which phages go best with a certain kind of antibiotic, um, then you, you can use less of both of them. Um, and But phages can also be antagonistic with um, antibiotics as well. So you've got to rule out that uh, from happening. Isn't it funny how reductionist we are about things? You know, one particular solution to a specific problem, but we're finding out more and more that there are groups of things that seem to work together synergistically. And it's not a surprise since that's what our very cells do. Um, well, but it's I, nice and I to also... See I see a, a real potential for machine learning to come into play here too, because um, you know if we, if we use um, machine learning um, algorithms to be able to predict which phages should go together in a cocktail, or which phages should be matched to a specific antibiotic, or even this is my dream is to figure out where to do phage hunting. Um, you know, we know that, for example, Burkholderia cepacea is an organism that is found a lot of the time in bogs and swamps and rice paddies. Um, and, and we've learned this um, because people who um, are picking the rice in these rice paddies would actually get uh, Burkholderia infections. So obviously that's a great place to go for phage um, that are active against Burkholderia, which is commonly uh, affecting cystic fibrosis patients who get lung infections. But that was kind of an opportunistic kind of um, observation. So um, what if we were able to use machine learning to, to be able to um, source phages better from the environment? We, we would be a real leg up. You know, I, I have a question here. What's to prevent the human immune system from recognizing the bacteriophages and inactivating them? Or is it some kind of race? Well, you know, actually, that's a really good question. I mean, what we're really dealing with in vivo inside the human body is the interaction between the bacterium the phage and the human immune system. And the hum human immune system can identify the phage as an invader. Um, and sometimes there are antibodies that are directed against the phage and not always do those affect the clinical outcome. Um, there are many cases where antibodies are actually detected, but the patient improves anyway. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, well, why wouldn't the human immune system go haywire if you inject phages like you did um, in Tom's case? And it, maybe it's not a surprise because researchers like Jeremy Barr have shown that 30 billion phages, that's with a B, move in and out of our tissues every single day. So our bodies are awash with phage. It's just that they're the viral dark matter, as Dr. Hatfall likes to refer to it, that we haven't been able to detect until fairly recently with some of our more modern um, developments like uh, metagenomics. I am looking at, at our, our time. And what I thought, if I might, is to ask you a little bit, not simply about the success that you had, the wonderful treatment of your husband. You've mentioned other places that have been springing up doing this kind of work. Can you talk a little bit about your organization at uh, UC San Diego and what their future is going to be like? Great. Well, um, we had enough success treating other patients after Tom that our chancellor uh, gave us seed funding to begin IPATH, the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, which is the first center of its kind in the U.S. that is dedicated to phage therapy. And our goal really is twofold. One is that we want to make it easier for patients to get phage therapy. It's still cumbersome because it's experimental treatment and the FDA has to approve every case, but it's easier to get than it was for, you know, my situation with Tom. The other is to usher phages into clinical trials. And that's what's going to be necessary um, to ensure that if, if phages are studied and compared against antibiotics, and they do just as well or better, then the FDA can approve them more widely. And so there's several phage therapy trials underway, not just in the US and in Canada, but also in Europe. 
And so I'm very excited to see that happen because it's going to have to be many trials with many different kinds of underlying conditions and different kinds of organisms to ensure that we can move the field forward. I have so many thoughts about these things and, and, and not enough time to ask them all, but the whole kinetics of how the phage are able to find the bacteria in the human body is fascinating to me. And I know that there are lots of, lots of people thinking about it. And I want to also say to the listeners and viewers that I'm jotting down all the links that I'm going to put <laughs> from this session online. Now, this will include lots of different things, of course, but I thought that you might want to take just a couple of minutes and talk about the sorts of things that you would like the listeners to really think about. Well, a couple of my colleagues and I wrote an uh, invited review article for Cell recently, and I'll make sure that that's one of the links that's available. And we uh, made sure that we didn't just talk about the applications of phage in medicine, but its applications um, for um, a world health uh, and a one health perspective. Because when we talk about antimicrobial resistance, it's really the interface between humans, animals, and the environment. So phage can be used, for example, um, to uh, not just treat bacterial infections in humans, but maybe even to prevent an infection, say, um, in an outbreak of cholera. Um, right now, we're using them to respond to outbreaks. In fact, there is an outbreak of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's an XDR or extremely drug resistant strain, XDR Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and it's associated with contaminated eye drops. It's um, led to several deaths and eye amputations. And we have phages that will match that isolate. So um, that's another um, application of phage. Phage can be used in veterinary medicine. They can be used to um, treat crops or to, um, to be used um, in animal husbandry to reduce the amount of antibiotics that are used um, in um, pigs and cattle and in chicken. And that's actually one of the biggest sources of antimicrobial resistance is its overuse in, in uh, farming. My understanding is, is the number one use of antibiotics is actually agriculture. Exactly. 70% and in the U.S. and 80% in Canada of antibiotics are being used in those sources. So, you know, your listeners are also consumers. You can choose to eat meat or not. And if you do, you can buy organic, you can buy antibiotic free meat. So it's, it's important that you realize that as a consumer, you have purchasing power. Um, it's going to take more than phage to turn around antimicrobial resistance. Well, this is wonderful, wonderful stuff. Do you, do you have any thoughts about the future of your program? Well, I mean, my goal is to really ad advance phage therapy and, um, and to also, um, Enlist the help of students as citizen scientists. There is a wonderful program called the Sea Phages Program that exists in over 100 universities around the world. Um, most of these are upper income countries, however. It would be great to see a Sea Phages Program in Africa and in parts of Asia. So I'm really hopeful that we can, you know, enlist the, the help of students. They're already sourcing phages that have been used to successfully treat human infections. So imagine as a student getting not only to name a phage and to sequence it and to go into a phage library, but saving a life. I mean, that's pretty cool. A phage from a rotting eggplant in South Africa was used to save the life of a young girl in, in the United Kingdom. Um, that's the power of science. So the Sea Phages program for our listeners is this wonderful program put together. I'll put a link in the show notes where certainly in this country, the idea is it's a one-year introductory program. First semester, you look for the bacteriophages. Second semester, you analyze it. And it so happens they used a type of a mycobacterium for this um, originally. And that's what Graham Hatful's original idea was. But what's amazing, as you just mentioned, is some of the results from these programs have already been used in clinical trials. Bit of humor, though. They did have to institute a rule, my understanding is, that the students were no longer able to name all of their bacteriophages after Nicolas Cage. <laughs> That's right. I have a phage named after me. I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a really wonderful way. This idea of like a course-based research experience for students is so critical. And I, all, I always have students who say, what's the medical relevance? Well, here you go. 
Absolutely. Well, if anybody wants to learn more about IPATH, you can go to our website, IPATH dot ucsd.edu we're also fundraising to build a phage library and to also uh, defray some of the costs associated with phage therapy for patients um, so um, look for us there's lots more happening in this space oh it's absolutely wonderful work i am so delighted we had this opportunity to talk do you have anything coming up that you would like people to know about I, I do know that you've given me some links already, but is there anything special you'd like our viewers and listeners to think about? Well, uh, we're delighted that CNN International's program Vital Signs is going to be featuring us. Um, and uh, that's just a couple of days away. Um, and um, also, uh, we've had some Hollywood interest about our story. So phage is the rage, um, not just in the science world, but wouldn't it be great to ensure that the average person knows about phage therapy um, because this 100 year old forgotten cure has been there all along under our butts. <laughs> and, uh, you Literally. know, we need to take advantage of it. Okay. What is the actor who will play you? Come on. You have to have some ideas. I already know who that is going to be. So I can't say. <laughs> all right. Well, that's wonderful to know. Well, really, I so appreciate your time, Stephanie. It means a lot to me that you spent the time talking with us. And I am, I'm, it's, I, I'm, I'm kind of starstruck, to be honest with you, because I've been following your work and what you do. I'm so delighted about your book, and I will put a link to your book in the show notes as well. And I want to thank you for your time today. Thanks very much. You- I just also want to say that my husband and I realized how privileged we were, um, that we had the resources and the connections to save his life, and not everybody has that opportunity. And that's why we decided to write our book, The Perfect Predator, so to make it easier for other people to access phage therapy. Well, it's, it's I you know, despite all the, the difficult and frightening times, this is a true story of wonder and success. And I want to thank you for sharing it with us today. Thanks, Mark. This has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of the microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes with a cornucopia of wonderful links can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Stephanie Strafty can be found at the UC San Diego School of Medicine in La Jolla, California, and I really miss San Diego, I have to say. Many, many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and clarifications, and Reber Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope you've all enjoyed being part of our Quality Quorum today. See you next week on Matters Microbial.